it means all the way to the end of our lives. It doesn't mean to the end of retirement. It That's doesn't mean to retirement. It means to the end of our lives. And so if we're in a relationship with Christ, it requires us to be lifelong long learners all the way to the end. Because sanctification doesn't stop. Becoming more like Christ doesn't stop. Mm. Hello, Uncuffed family. I'm happy to introduce the head honcho, the El Jefe <laughs> of Hope Community Church, Pastor Chris Jones. It's good to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is episode seven, and we are talking about expanding our capacity. Pastor Chris is a really good friend of mine. More than that, he's a really good mentor of mine. Yeah. He's a business owner. He is a, an amazing husband and father. Well, I don't know if Beth would say that, but, <laughs> but he's an amazing husband and father. And he's somebody who, the more you get to know him, the more you realize that he is true to who he says he is. And he is truly pursuing getting better. So yeah. I thought no one was better at talking about expanding their mm. capacity because this man has been in almost every role at this church. I mean, uh, you've, you've done everything here, yeah, right? A good, good bit of it. it. If not everything, a good bit of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, sound lighting. You were the worship pastor at one point, the yeah. youth pastor, the executive pastor, and now mm -hmm. you're the lead pastor. That's yeah. a pretty good resume, I'd have to say. Yeah, I think when you started a small church and then you work up and the church grows as as the years go by, you end up naturally kind of working through a progression if you stay. And so that's what I did. I just stayed and worked through the progression and, you know, like 17 years into it, became a lead pastor. So, yeah, it's been a fun journey. Um, but that's the deal. If you stay long enough, you get to do it all. <laughs> I like that. And you get to learn it all <laughs> yeah, too, right? That's true. Yeah. I, I, what I've realized is there's really nothing here at the church that you can't put your hands to. You know, I remember I was so surprised when I heard that you, you could do the sound and you could, you could sing a little bit, which was quite surprising, but, but you can literally like tinker with anything and make it work. So that's, that's pretty cool. Kudos to you on that. Yeah. And I hope you. I can get to that point. So Chris, Tell me why it's important to you to be able to do so many things here at Hope or, or in any capacity. Why is it important to you to be that way? Part of it is the way I'm wired. I'm just wired to explore things, to figure things out. There's a deep um, seated idea in me that, that um, things are worth figuring out, that they're worth leaning into enough to find out how they work, why they work, all those things. So I'm a, I'm a hands-on learner. Uh, I can read and learn, but my preference is to just jump into the middle of it and learn as the process is happening. So that, that ends up requiring me. Um, so the way my brain operates, that requires me to get in the middle of a lot of things. And I know that's, you know, time constraining and all that, all those things working out a schedule. But over the years, um, um, I didn't have a big, it, it wasn't a turnoff to me to just throw myself into something and, and then learn during the process. So because of the way I'm wired, I'm, I'm an eight on the Enneagram. I'm an achiever. Um, those type of things lended itself to just full force going into something and figuring it out on the way. If you're wired a little bit differently, you may want to gather a whole bunch of information. And what what can happen is if you don't get enough information or you don't or the information doesn't fit together right away, it may kind of block you in exploring things. And just because of the way I'm naturally bent, it was just a great recipe for me to just jump into a ton of different things and um and and do the on the job training type of deal. So um I do think it's important for people to, whether they, whether you're a reader or a researcher type that you need to get a, gather a lot of information to not limit yourself as far as how you, um, what you're willing to learn about or what you're willing to explore and, and figure out how to be tactile about it, figure out how to jump in every now and then and explore it kind of deeply. And, um, it doesn't mean I was good at everything I did or, or um, successful at everything, but it did give me a great, like, 
library of information and skill that uh, ended up kind of being a little bit unique. And so I'm, I've, I've done all kinds of these unrelated things that end up as a leader. What it does is it gives you this this background, this knowledge in the background that maybe people don't know about that, that now you can link all these different things together and, and maybe come up with some unique solutions that haven't that people don't think about right off the bat. That's cool. I, I, I love the fact that you talk about um, how everything kind of pulls together all these disparate things. Um, but my first question to you then, and this is what I heard is, is the need to know yourself a little bit better in order to understand, yeah. in order to move forward. So why is that so important? The need to understanding who we are, what we're capable of first as a starting point before we yeah. do all those other things. So one thing is, um, so the way I learn, which is different from a lot of the way other people learn, I'll talk to people about this. So I do it while I'm watching the YouTube video the first time. I can't do that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching the YouTube video. I'm working on the thing and, um, and I'll, uh, I like that guy takes this thing apart. I'm taking the thing apart while he's taking it. I'll push pause. I'll, I'll do what he did. And then I push play. He's doing it. I'll do it again. Now that might drive some people nuts because they're like, you haven't researched it. You haven't done any of this. True. All that is true. And have I been caught in the middle of that? Absolutely. You get to the middle of it. You're like, well, that person has a tool that I don't have. Mm. So now I got to figure out how to adjust and compensate. Okay. I think there's benefit in that whole process because I'm learning in the moment how to adjust and compensate and all those things. Now, is that perfect in every circumstance? No, but it's the way I learn and it's, it's, it fits my personality. Now, what has had to happen over the years, I can't do that in a large church. I can't just jump in the middle of it and then go, oh, we weren't equipped to do that. So I've had to take the natural way I think about it and couple it with some unnatural ways that I think about things. And maybe the way you think about things more where you're more planned out, I am. you're more, you know, we're going to do the research first. We're going to make sure this works, make sure this works. So, so that, that was fine when it was just me and one thing. Um, but now when you're responsible for a whole bunch of things, I've got to pull myself away from that a little bit, lean into the other side of it where we have to do, there's due diligence that has to take place here. There, there's research that has to take place. We have to know that this is a, that we're capable counting the cost before it happens. Right. Yeah. So, so I've, I've had to lean into that other area, but I know that about myself having, having enough. Uh, intelligence about the way your your own brain works and about the way your own personality is. So I, I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I didn't say, well, the way you've been doing it is wrong. I just said, the way I've been doing it has got me the knowledge that I have, but in order to lead more people, I do have to lean into another way to do things. So being flexible, realizing that I read a book one time that was called Personality Isn't Permanent. Mm. That you know, base, the more we learn, the more we lean into who we are and the more we allow God to adjust that and the more we apply scripture to our life and learn to adapt to our circumstances, our personality just does ebb and flow. So now I'm comfortable playing the YouTube video once and doing it, but I'm also comfortable watching the YouTube video 10 times. I don't think one's better than the other because there's circumstances in the church where I have to be researched. I have to be, have a plan for five years. I have to be farther out than just, oh, I didn't watch that part of the video yet. Yeah. So well, being okay with both sides of it. Well, I think that's pretty unique because you mentioned you were an Enneagram eight and I am an Enneagram five. So I am the person that will research till I'm dead and never really make a move yeah, on yeah, something. Yeah. Um, and I've had to in this capacity, yeah. learn to just say, okay, this is the this is the thing to do in this moment. Let's just go get it done. But that took a lot of prying and yeah. pressure. And and I'll say you do a pretty good job of that is giving us the room and the grace to be able to to make those mistakes. Yeah. But why do you think some people though understand where their gaps are, where their issues are, but they decide to stay there. They stick. You, you mentioned personality is impermanent. 
why do some people stick with their personality and kind of hold it almost yeah. as like a mantle? Yeah, it's just comfortable. I mean, it's just what we're used to. It's what we've fostered. It's what we've grown up with. Um, it takes work. It takes legitimate work. So, so the, so Enneagram five may research something and research something research and never feel like you've gotten to the end of it, which is probably true. Nobody's <laughs> researched anything to the end of it. Um, so you may feel like, well, I don't know enough to pull this off. Well, that could incapacitate you as far as, as far as accomplishing in life and reaching goals and all those things. So being, being aware that that's, it's not a, you bring something to the table that an eight is not going to bring to the table. So you bring preparedness. You bring, you bring, I've thoroughly looked through this. I've gathered the information. The danger of that, because there's good sides and bad sides to every, every personality. So the danger of the five is, well, may never pull the trigger, may never go ahead with it. The danger of the eight is we pull the trigger. We don't even know where we're at. Like, we don't even know. What's it going to cost? I don't know. We'll just figure it out when we go. Yeah. So what I found is when you put both of those people in the same room, great things happen. When, when God designed us with all these personalities that are beneficial, and when you make sure all the personalities are in the same room, uh, we need the person that's going to ask the questions to make sure. We need the detailed person. We need the follow-through person. We, we need the research person. We need all those things. And then we do need the person that's going to say, okay, we got enough information. Let's do it. Um, when you're a leader, the, the key is to be able to manage all those people, to be able to bring all those people in the room with no, no ego, no, not feeling insecure, being able to say, you know what, Ken, I need you to do what you do great. But the other thing is I need you to lean into what I do great. And, and so once we understand ourselves and we can understand the deficiency I have is where you make is where you're great. It's you make up for my deficiency and I make up for your deficiency. So the body of Christ works like that, especially in a church and in leadership, even outside the church. Like people can get tunnel vision about, well, this is the this is the right personality for this. Yeah. And really, OK, is an eight the person that typically can stand up in front and go charge the hill? Let's get it done. Yes. But where the eight benefits is having all the other personalities around them going, hey, we made like we, we did all the research. We asked all the questions. We checked all the checks and, and we and we and we're sure this is the right way to go. OK, now I've got a ton of confidence that this is what we should be doing. And Absolutely. I and I can. So that's just, that's something you grow into as a leader, being able to trust the people around you, even though they think differently, even though they're 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 polar opposites of the way you would approach the issue. Uh, but they're but all, all of us together working as a team to make sure it happens right. I love that. And it's funny you say that the, the gathering of information. When I was a catcher, I used to go s literally scout other teams, like the team we were going to play. And I would literally write a report on each <laughs> batter, how far they stood in the box, what, how did they adjust to a certain yeah. pitch. And then when, when it was time for us to play them, I would, I would say to my pitcher, okay, this batter, this yeah. is what we're trying to do. And my, my wife used to think I was crazy. And I'm like, that's just how my brain, I need to yeah. be able to organize how this is because if i'm going into a battle i want to know how how th what's the viscosity of the mud over in this corner <laughs> where where are we where do we have like gaps in our in our ability to attack here yeah, where can they yeah. flank us like i want to know a total picture of what we're going to get into because if not in the moment i'm going to be more stressed out i won't be able to adjust because i don't have all the information yeah. gathered so yeah kudos to you to be able to just say let's just charge the hill and see what no but it, it's if i don't have people like you on the team if we're not working together then i get in a whole bunch of trouble and and the the, the issue is when it's just me i may be able to navigate the trouble when the organization gets larger you can't afford to do that so if it's just me and there's a tool i don't have i can probably go to the store and buy the tool it just makes the project a little longer mm. When you're when you're leading a larger organization, all of a sudden you start to lose credibility. 
like, oh, he jumped into it and didn't know what was going on. He didn't know how it was going to impact everybody. He didn't. They, they weren't making sure that they knew the cost of what it what it was going to take. So, these are all credibility killers that demand that there's multiple personalities at the table to make sure the organization runs well. And um, I think we've all been a part of things where you've had people incapacitated to move. And that's a bad thing. And we've also all been part of things where people were just hard charging and just run over people and didn't ask. And it just it turned out bad the opposite way. So so knowing that about yourself, intimately knowing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, allow you to build a team that fill that comp, or complement your strengths, but also fill in all the gaps of I'm not a detail person. Um, I'm not a I'm not a person who's going to think through all the minutia of every aspect of the, of whatever's going to happen. I'm just not wired that way, and so it is it is extremely important for me to gather those type of people around me because their gift set is something that that I'm not great at, and uh, and to appreciate that and lean into it. That takes a certain level of humility and, oh, and yeah. authenticity to be able to say that. So let me ask you this, that that's a lot of information for someone to take in is like, hey, I have to get better here, here and here. How do you organize or figure out which priority you should change first, which part of your personality or, or dealings should be tackled first? Because I doubt anybody can do all of this all yeah. at the same time. It's going to take external input. There's very few people that are great at self-assessment. Um, most people might be able to pick out a few things about themselves that that they could improve on, uh, but you're gonna have a blind spot. You're gonna have pretty a pretty huge blind spot. You may not have a rear view mirror, or you may only have a rear view mirror. Mm. Um, you may have your window tinted, windows tinted so dark on the side you can't see out. So, So the issue is, I started pretty early on having older people be honest with me and assess where I was in life and what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were. It's always fun to have somebody around you to compliment you, but that can become poison at some point in time without the right amount of critique. So there's a balance. Uh, if all you eat sugar, then your teeth are going to fall out. But if all you eat rocks, your teeth are going to fall out. <laughs> You're going to get the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, so being able to gather and I always I typically would find older people because they have a different they have a, a longer context of life than I do. So I would bring them in and still do today. And I would say, hey, um, do you think I'm handling this well? Where do you think I can improve on this? How how could I have approached this differently? And. Even with staff, you have being being transparent about, hey, how do you think I handled that in the staff meeting? D do you think I was too abrupt? Do you think I was? Um, so so getting genuine feedback, you get it. You can get it from your spouse. You can get it from your kids. I have adult kids now, and so I can have adult conversations with them about, um, hey, I think I overreacted there. What do you think? So. Um, so being able to get that feedback, because very few of us by nature are able to are able to say, well, I'm really good at this and I'm really not good at this. That's true. Um, for, for a variety of reasons. But it's important to get that feedback. When you get that feedback, it's important not to just go, OK, I got the feedback. But then but then actually make make progress, make actionable steps to to go, OK, this is what I'm lacking in. And this is where I need to be, not just for me personally, but for the people I work with and the people that work for me. So what what things do I need to do on a daily basis to get to that place? And so we're li we are literally talking about changing the way we think about stuff a lot of times. And if you want to throw in there changing your personality, maybe it's an issue where I, I get upset too quick or I'm too emotional or I'm not emotional enough or a gamut of things that I could go from here to here. This is what I need to do to improve. So um, without external input, I think that's a very, very hard thing to do. So now what you're basically saying is you're disproving a lot of people's ideas that 
the older you get, the the more locked in your brain and your personality become. Can you explain on that a little bit more? Because what I'm hearing is that y- your brain can actually be rewired even as an adult. I hope so. <laughs> No, we've we've bought into that. Like, uh, I can't te- teach old dog new tricks. Um, I am who I am. Everybody's gonna have to get over it. Um, you hear people all the all the time apologize. Well, I'm I'm sorry. I just I just say what I think, and I'm like, ah, I don't know if that's a great idea or not. Um, yeah, what what we found. I'm not a brain expert by any stretch of the imagination, but what we found out is your brain is malleable all the way up to the end of life. Like you can create new neurological pathways. You can rewire your brain. And if we talk about in a biblical context, this is, this is what the Bible teaches, renewing our mind, taking every thought captive, being able to, being able to take how we think, be able to transform. Paul says we were a slave to sin before we came to Christ. And now we're a slave to righteousness. Well, that is a rewiring of our brain and actions we change in the heart, which then changes what we think, then changes what we do. So when we apply that to our to our everyday lives, where we need to get better, where, where we need to change, we are actually putting off these thoughts and putting on new thoughts. So I know, I like in the last 25 years, everybody knows I'm not detail-oriented. Everybody already knows. It's, it's not a secret that I'm not, that I don't. I'm not super detailed about researching. Like I, I would, your illustration about the baseball, I just walked out, put a glove on and like, let's get at it. So, so the idea of me going, that is not acceptable in this circumstance. That's my knee jerk thought process. What are the steps I have to do now to replace that thought process in this with a different one that will produce better results? All right. Is it going to come naturally? No. Is it going to come easy? Probably not. But it's necessary work. And so anytime you're trying to change the way you think, anytime you're trying to change the way you feel about something is re I mean, that's manual labor stuff. And it's not it's not what our culture really, really reinforces or buys into, because what we do is we say, well, this is my identity. I'm going to lock into it. Mm. Well, great leaders learn how to morph into whatever the circumstance requires. So, so as an organization grows, the circumstance is going to require different things. You can't lead 20 people like you lead 20,000 people. So being aware of that and understanding that it is possible for me to think differently. And so I would venture to say any great leader that does this type of work, they take personality tests and they may lean towards the same thing, but it should look different. I think it should look different because we're constantly understanding things about ourselves, leaning into correcting, adjusting. And so I'm, I hope and pray that in 10 years when I take a personality test, it's a little, it's different than what I took 10 years before. And that's, that, that's hope for me. Because at 25 years old, I'm a bull in a china closet, not taking anyone else's advice, not taking anyone else's input and just going, man, I'm going to just do it. I don't care. And at 47 years old, I can't be that guy. And so a lot of times we'll use the word maturing. Well, this is somebody who's matured and and that that can be true. But making sure that process never stops so we don't turn 40 and say, well, they're a mature person. Um, but the process goes all the way to the end. And, and I think that's, I think that's Im- embodying, uh, the image of, of Christ in us that we haven't yet achieved, but we are working towards it. And the idea that we will be changing our thought processes all the way to the end of our lives is, is a godly one. I love that. And I think about the, the word you used hope for you there. And I love that because there is a lot of hopelessness for people that that don't um, ha- a have a connection with Christ, but B don't feel like it's possible for them to be different, yeah. do anything different. And of course, I just the past couple of episodes, I talked to Pastor Skip and Donna about marriage. And and that was sort of the thing that they were talking about is that when we are able to see what we're adding in our marriage or what we're detracting from our marriage and we start working on those things, 
the people around us start to flourish oh, and yeah. the people around us start to grow. And I love how you're talking about that with leadership. You're not growing because you think that it's the right thing to do for you. Yeah, yeah. You're doing it because you think it's the right thing to do to benefit the people around you. And I think that's the difference between being a leader and, and being somebody that's all about self. Yeah. And you're right. We live in a culture today where everything is about self. We literally have things called selfies because yeah. <laughs> we would rather take a picture of ourselves with the sunset in the back than actually take a picture yeah. of the sunset and give people a full view of things. So you also mentioned earlier that you go to people that are older than you. And, I, mm. and I'll say this, Kendra and I have always been those type of people. We've always um, befriended older people. Yeah. We, we love older people because there's a certain sense of, of wisdom that comes with that, but also there's a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. Older people, especially older Christians, seem to have a different sort of peace about the world than we yeah. do. When, when calamities strike, they're like, been there, done that. Yep. When when issues are happening, yep. even in marriage, they're like, oh, honey, you're going to get through. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think it's really cool. So, And that's kind of the culture we have here at church. We have a diverse range of people. Yep. I think the oldest person in our church is what, 83 yeah, or 84? Yeah, they're or in their 80s, yeah. In sure. their 80s. And then we, of course, have all the new bouncing babies. But there is a certain level of honor yeah. that... that the younger people in this church have for the older generation. And I think that does start with, with you as the leader, because yeah. that's what you, you talk about. That's what you, you do. So why is it so important for, for us in the process of expanding our capacity to have those older people to, to bounce our ideas off of, yeah. to, to grow. One of the things that happens, and it's happened to me, is you think whatever circumstance you're in in the moment is the worst thing that could be happening. We have that tendency to think we everybody's do. got the hardest job that any of anybody. If you talk to anybody with a job, they're like, oh, my job's so hard. And, and I tend to think in terms of I don't have, there's no way I have the most stressful job on the planet. You, you look at any president, and if they go into office with dark hair, it's gray in four years. It is. It's it's just the it's just a stress level that you can't even fathom. And and so I I typically try not to gauge anything I'm doing as if it's the hardest, but that's typical of of how people think. Oh, I I've got such a hard job. Okay. So left to ourselves that's how we typically process stuff if i can get somebody 30 years older than me who who has a totally different context maybe on the other side of working and they're speaking into my life they go hey it'll be all right settle down they're, they don't get as excited about the things i'm losing my mind about they've been through it they've raised kids they've had marriages they've done the whole thing and so the the beautiful thing is they can they can speak to it from the other side if I'm going to talk to business guys, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk to less people starting out. I want to talk to the people that have finished. I want to talk to the people that have finished. Now I might go to the person starting out to figure out, um, culturally what's, what's the thing I need to do right now. That's, that's going to, that's going to make me stand out. I might talk to those people about that, but how to, how to stay longevity, how to, treat people, all those things. I'm looking to the person that's already done it all. I'm looking to the person that's already been successful, that knows what success feels like and looks like. Because what happens is, you know, if I'm in a boat that's sinking and I got a bunch of people my age in the same boat, the truth of the matter is we're all sinking together. That's true. If I'm talking to only people my age or younger in marriage, we're all experiencing the same difficulties. And none of us, if, if we all got the same age kids, we're all figuring it out. And so if I can talk to somebody who's got kids 10, 15 years older than mine, they've already walked through everything I'm getting ready to walk through. And so that brings a confidence in me that, hey, all these people made it. They're speaking into my life. They're, they're talking to me about things that I haven't thought about before, I haven't considered, because nobody in my spheres can, knows it yet. So being able to pull those people in is, is a huge resource and benefit and it keeps me from making the same dumb mistakes because you'd be shocked at how many 
older business people, successful people, successful marriage, all those things, they want to tell you where they messed up. They want to say, hey, listen, I did this, this, and this. I don't recommend any of those. (laughs) But if I had to do it over again, this is what I would do. And that's a wealth of knowledge. And so if you can... If you can get to the place where we can put our egos down a little bit, it doesn't have to all be our idea. Then all of a sudden we invite those people in the room with experience and we just start asking questions. Hey, how did you do this? How did, what did you learn from that? And they are more than willing to tell you more than willing. Uh, I've always said this, but every time an old person dies, it's like a library burning down. Yeah, yeah. It really is. And, and I've seen that, you know, your kids are all adults and, and we're only 10 years apart, but you are in a much different season than mine. Oh, one yeah. of your daughters is married, you know, the other one is living out of state and, yep. and stuff like that. So if I'm going to ask anybody about what the teenage years looks like, it's yeah. going to be you. You're right. Yeah. I'm not going to ask someone who is just getting into the teenage phase yeah. or anything like that. Same thing. I want to know how did you survive it and why are your kids so successful and thriving today? Yeah. Um, and, and the coolest part about it for me is that you've been in ministry for the greater part of your life mm-hmm. and all of your children are still in some capacity attached to yeah. the church, whether they're serving or they're attending. Yep. So kind of tell me what, what that was like and how you had to kind of morph yourself as a parent to yeah. make sure that your kids stayed on that pathway. This is going to sound strange because I've been a pastor. And so my life has been focused around the church, but we wanted our kids relationship with God to transcend the church. So the church is not perfect. There's, there's uh, any church has difficulties. Any church has relational issues. Any church has growing pains, Every church has some type of betrayal in it. Every church has some type of issue, conflict. It, it's all there. We're, there's regular people in churches going through the sanctification process, and, and they're, they're working together. So all these things pop up. And, and a lot of times over the years, people's experience in church uh, has been negative at times. And what you find out is you'll hear people say, well, I grew up in this church and it was like this. And that's why I don't go to church anymore. And what they're a lot of times what they're saying is my relationship with God was tied to the church. And then when the church did what they did, I didn't have a relationship with God anymore. So do I think church is important? Absolutely. I think I think God set it up, designed it, made it an institution for people to be a part of and for the gospel to flourish through. The issue is, is I wanted my kids relationship with him not to be totally dependent on the church. The church is where we get um, discipled. The church is where we get equipped. All those, the church is where we have family and friends and, and, and we, we share each other's burdens. Um, But if the church goes bad, it doesn't mean that my relationship with God goes bad. And so what we started doing early is saying, look, Look, the church is important. It's God's design for you to have community and to be equipped to do what he called you to do. But the church is not God. And so we wanted our kids' relationships to transcend church because we didn't know where they were going to end up. We didn't know what kind of jobs they were going to have. It's not uncommon for people to work on Sundays. It's not uncommon for people to be in other countries and not have the same in countries that don't have the same traditions as ours going to church on a Sunday. So we wanted to make sure that even if our children moved somewhere, like our oldest daughter studied in, in at Cardiff University in Wales, well, that's not a that's not a church going culture. There were churches there, but they're very few and far between compared to here. So you're gonna have to kind of search one out, and and we wanted her to be plugged into a church, but we didn't want a relationship with God to be totally dependent on her being plugged into church. So that was one of the things we started to think about early was like, how do we structure our life in a way and and what we teach our kids in a way that their relationship with God transcends all these other things, all these other good, good, good things, but bad things as well. And how can we, how can we train them up so that even if calamity hits, the relationship with God doesn't suffer. So that was a, that was a very important thing to us. And it's played out over the years 
that when they become adults, their, their relationship with God transcends going to college, you know, at a big university where there's all kinds of stuff to get into and, um, and getting married and getting careers and moving, moving 10 hours away, all those things, uh, their relationship with God transcended all that. And, uh, and so that, that was right at the end of the day, that was the goal. That was the goal. We want their relationship with God to be the foundation and uh, be built on God and not peripheral things, whether good or bad. I like that. So speaking of relationships, and this, this make, may make sense and may not in this context, but how do we then as, as people, believers or regular people, how do we expand our capacity and not alienate people or become alienated by people at the same time? Is, is that possible or does change naturally bring about a sense of, of, yeah. of division and alienation? I think life happens in seasons. I tend not to think about whether people are alienated from me or not. Um, I think life happens in seasons. So when our kids were playing uh, soccer, there were people we were around all the time. Some of those people became lifelong friends, not all of them. So there were people we hung around with every weekend when the kids played soccer. A few of those we're still friends with today, not not all of them. So that was a season of life we're in. So they say you what have two or three lifelong friends, real close friends, um, and I th- I think that tends to be true. So if if um, the, again this goes back to personality and capacity, if you're if you're a personality type that feeds off of other people and you need people around you all the time, you may find it a little more devastating when seasons of life change, like oh my kid went from elementary school to intermediate school and now we're not hanging around the same parents this is devastating um there will be more seasons like that where the people we associate with is is not good or bad it's just a season of life Mm. and if we attempt to keep all those people tight 50 60 people in our lives super close super tight you just wear yourself out wear yourself out so you think about in, in the context of the gospel, how do I serve the people God's put me around in this season? Okay. That's a completely different way of thinking of it. Yeah. So you had, you grew up in Baltimore. You had friends in Baltimore. You left Baltimore and came to West Virginia. It would be naive to think that you could have the same level of friendship with the people you used to be. They might've been great people. But it would be really naive to think two hours away you could sustain that same relationship you had in Baltimore when you lived there. That's true. Well, that would be a guilt that you shouldn't you shouldn't bear because the season of your life changed. You became an adult. You got married. You had kids. You started a career outside of Baltimore. All those things, and they were all good. There was nothing bad about that. And so, depending on your personality type, those things can be more difficult or less difficult, I tended to look at it as God put us, now we've lived in the same town, we lived in the same house a long time, we've had the same neighbors, we've been at the same church. But even in that context, seasons change. And I'll be, and there's, I'm closer to people in one season than I am in another. And I don't look at that as a good or bad thing, I just look at it as seasons. And how do I, how do I effectively, um, pour into the people, serve the people that God put me around in that season for as long as that season lasts. And I think if we're faithful to do that, then we, then we bear fruit in those seasons. That's good. That's good. Faithful to do that. Yeah, (laughs) I agree with that. So in that line of context and thinking, then uh, my final question for you is this thinking about being faithful, what keeps you going when, when things seem to be bumping up against you or or life is is in a season where where it seems like you can't get your head above water and and i'm asking you this is Mm -hmm. almost personal for me not Mm -hmm. right now but i've gone through these seasons before but to our listeners what keeps you going when you feel like you just can't keep taking another step caffeine (laughs) no (laughs) 
I wish it was that easy. Um, look, every human being on the planet is going to experience this. This is not unique to anyone. Everybody is going to feel overwhelmed, underprepared, under-equipped, all, the, all those things at some point in time in your life. Um, I happen to be a personality that just kind of lives in that space because by nature, I take on things. I'm an accomplisher. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm achiever, push out, push out. And so my schedule tends to be full. The constant conversations I have with counselor and friends is how to manage rest, how to get enough sleep, how to eat well, how to manage my health. And, um, and that's a constant conversation. I'm literally having the conversation now uh, in this season of my life. What does the work rest? I'm a pastor and I'm still having the conversation. What does the work rest rhythm look like? It's six on one off, six on one off. And so I said two weeks ago, you mean six months on one month off? Like, how, what are we doing? I don't, I don't know what's going on. Okay. So, so that's a, that's an issue that I have and, it, and it's a tension that I'm constantly dealing with. And to be honest with you, uh, I think it will end up being a tension. There's seasons of life where I'm better at it. Seasons of life where I'm awful at it. Um, but it's, it, but it's something part of the sanctification process in me that, that is constantly trying to be figured out. Okay. What drives me in those, mo in those moments is an underlying core thing in my life. When I read Ephesians 2.10, where it says, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared it for you in advance. The problem is, I don't know what they are. Oh, okay. Now, okay. Okay. I might know what it is today because I got a schedule today. I'm going to come in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a, I got a, a meeting this afternoon. I've got a bunch of things I've got to prepare for in between then. I've got a, I've got a meeting this evening and then I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know what opportunities are popping up. You know, we just got an opportunity to do That's something right. that wasn't even on the radar. That's right. Okay. So I take Ephesians 2.10 and I say, he prepared all these things that he has not yet told me in advance. They're already in the works. They're already in front of me. They're already down the road. So for me, that's exciting. For me, that's a driver. That's like, God, man, God's got more things for me to do. It's not monotony. It's new things. It's expanding things. It's things that are going to challenge me. So I look at Ephesians 2.10 and I put it out in the future and I go, he prepared stuff for me out there to accomplish. All right. So how, what do I have to, what's the mentality I have to have to expand my capacity in order to do all those things he wants me to do? So I, I typically use this illustration of, um, of digging in the dirt. I think most people uh, become adults and they, and they tend to label themselves pretty quickly. You say, what do you do? Well, you say, um, well, this is what I do for a living. What else do you do? Well, and then they start, then they'll start talking about, well, I love to go on vacation. Mm -hmm. I love to do this. I love to do that. But we pigeonhole ourselves into like, this is, this is what I do. All right. I, I buck that trend. What do I, I'm a pastor. I'm a business owner. I'm a communicator. I'm doing a whole bunch of, I'm a builder. I'm a mechanic. Sometimes I'm a maintenance guy. Sometimes it's just a whole bunch of different things. All right. What most people do is they scratch the surface of their capabilities. What do you do? Well, I'm a teacher. Well, is that all you can do? <laughs> like what? Like what? It, well, I got a degree in teaching. I got my master's degree in teaching and I'm a teacher. So they might have scratched down, you know, maybe six inches into the ground. And then what happens? Life happens. We we get a retirement. We, we're kind of locked in. We're getting paid well. We're doing whatever we're doing. We got benefits. Why change it? Mm. Why disturb the soil anymore? Is a pretty good deal. I get five weeks vacation. We can roll out. We, you know, we can have a good time, raise a good family. And and so why why even scratch why why mess the dirt up? Because that's normal. 
because that's what every that's what everybody's going for. My contention is if I know he's got things out front of me prepared in advance for me to do that he hasn't made me aware of, that he's given the skill sets in me to accomplish, I'm going to I'm going to throw the shovel away. I'm going to get a big excavator with a bucket and I'm going to dig down as deep as I can to figure out all those things that he wants me to accomplish. I don't want to get to the end and and and, and hear man, there was a lot more in you that you didn't find out about. Like if you'd have just dug a little bit more in your capability, if you pushed yourself a little bit harder in your thinking, if you learned, if, if, if you, man, if you, if you took one more course, if you, if you would have, if you would have done this one thing, it would have opened up all these other opportunities. So I typically like every day want to have a excavator bucket, digging deep hole in the ground and, and going, God, I don't want to miss some opportunity you have for me in the future because I wasn't prepared for it because my mindset wasn't right. And so I think capacity has all, everything to do with, first of all, how you think about life. Are you just are you looking for a job just to settle in and do the vacation, do the weekend thing? Or do you want to discover everything that God, that God has made you capable of? And it may look like a bunch of different stuff. You may not have to quit your job to do it, but you're going to have to definitely expand your thinking. And so if you take Ephesians 2.10, and, and you put in the context of digging in the ground. He's prepared a whole bunch of stuff for me in advance. And I want to dig up every amount of capability I have to accomplish all that stuff. So one of my biggest fears is getting to the end of my life and find out I could have, I could have accomplished more. Or I could have achieved more. I could have served more. I could have helped more people. Um, but I just didn't explore this one thing. I just didn't, I just didn't find out. I didn't run down the road far enough to find out this thing that I was capable of. And so, um, so that's the way I look at capacity. It's a, it's a, um, it's an adventure. It, it requires a explorer's mindset that, that you're personally going to dig into things that are in you, that God already put in you that have yet to been explored, yet to be tried, yet to be pushed to capacity. And, um, and I think that's so important. I know my capacity on a few things already. I'm 47 years old. I'm not been pre- bench pressing 350 pounds anymore. I'm going to, my capacity isn't the same for that. But there's other things that I know now that my capacity has dramatically expanded. A- and if I keep looking at it that way, hey, there's still room to dig in the hole as long as I'm breathing. I, I, think, um, I think I'll be able to accomplish a lot of what he put out in front of me. I love that. And when you were saying that, I thought about this concept. I was watching my, my younger brother, he plays for this uh, full tackle seven on seven league. And I was watching his game in New Jersey yesterday. <laughs> and I remember growing up, so I'm, I'm, I'm a few years older than him, but Growing up, we would go play with the kids in the neighborhood and stuff like that. And I coach football and I play football as well. But my brother, and I'm going to say this on camera, and I've never admitted this, he's <laughs> faster than me. <laughs> and if anyone knows me personally, they know that I am not some slow person, right? Like I ran a 444 40 time in high school. I'm really quick, but my brother, he's, he's a, a, a hair fat. <laughs> I'm going to give him a hair, right? <laughs> But when we used to play against each other, when we lined up against each other, I would whoop his butt. Yeah. Right. Not because I'm a better athlete because he's a better athlete than me Mm -hmm. um, and he's faster than me. But I understood the technical aspect of what we were doing. I understood the spacing. I understood the the leverage. I understood techniques that he didn't master yet. So what I'm hearing is it's sort of like that. It's not necessarily that our capacities are these far reaching things. It's already in us and God Mm -hmm. has already put it there. It's about fine tuning and unlocking those things. Yeah. Based on just keep digging. Yeah. Keep digging. So even if you are, are not the greatest, even if you aren't the best, there's still a usefulness for that tool or that yeah, that lesson or whatever it might be. So I just want to encourage the people that are listening to know that you don't have to be the greatest to have an impact. Oh, no, no, no. That would have disqualified everyone in scripture. Oh, that's, that's the, so true. The, the thing is, is the mindset of I, I don't I think it's 
incongruent to think you can be a Christian and not a lifelong learner. Paul says we look through a glass dimly now that that we don't understand everything about God or everything God God's plan in our lives, all those things. So that that would tell me that I'm not going to inherently just get it one day on this earth It's not. It's like physics. There's very few people on the planet that just go, oh, yeah, I took that physics class. I understood it from day one or calculus. I understood it from day one. So the issue is, what do you have to do? You have to lean into the process and be a committed learner through the whole process. So what's that mean about our lives? It means all the way to the end of our lives. It doesn't mean to the end of retirement. It doesn't mean to retirement. It means to the end of our lives. And so if we're in a relationship with Christ, it requires us to be lifelong learners all the way to the end. Because sanctification doesn't stop. Becoming more like Christ doesn't stop. Paul said that, in, to the church in uh, Philippians, he said, not that I've retained all this already, but one thing I do, I press on. So he, he was at the end of his life when he was saying that. So he's saying, I'm a lifelong learner about the things of God. I'm constantly learning and applying and adapting. So when it comes to us as individuals, that has to be the motivation. There's there's part of what God wants to do with me that I don't understand yet. And I have to learn what that is. And that doesn't stop when you reach 65 or 67. And when you look at people who do stop at those ages, you see their cognitive ability plummet yep. dramatically so fast. It's because, because God wired us to keep leaning into him. And when we don't lean into them, the effects of sin take over very quickly. Your mind and your body disappear. That's right. So it's possible for us to keep our cognitive abilities long, long after. And, and, and the, the part of that, that that facilitates it is us being lifelong learners. What am I going to learn about me? What am I going to learn different about the people around me? What am I going to learn different about something I never thought I'd explore? And so constantly leaning into it. I'm trying to learn Swahili now. Why? Because I think there's some God uh, things I've done over the last 10 years. There's a necessity for me to try to learn it. Why? Because I think God has something Ephesians 2 10 for me planned out in the future where, where that would be part of it. So does learning Swahili make me a better Christian or make me more like God? God knows Swahili. So maybe, <laughs> but, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, I'm leaning into your purpose for my life. And I'm not just going to say, well, this is as far as I'm leaning in. No, I've got the big bucket out and I'm digging deep. No, I'm going to lean in all the way for what you have for me. Wow, that's good. And and if you think about it, they say that when you learn a new language, it helps to stave off dementia a little bit yeah. because it's forcing your brain to, to kind of renew itself a little yeah. bit. How much more so than the language of God? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we talk about, we both are in biblical counseling classes right now to learn how to do that better. But we, what we are learning is that, is that the Bible, and when we dig into it and we go deeper, there is something that, that opens up about it. And, and the language of God is the greatest thing that we yeah. could ever learn. And I love that. I love how how God already planned it and now science is kind of catching up yeah. to what God already designed. But um, this was a fascinating conversation. Yeah, and and I definitely want to do this again with you, talking about some more deeper things because we are going through as a church a process of of getting better. It's gonna be it's oh, yeah. pretty intense. Oh yeah. And it's it's a three year process that we know of right now, but hopefully it leads to a lifelong change for us and, and development as a team. And, and anyone that's listening right now, um, you have so much more you can give. And you heard Pastor Chris talk about that. It's about stepping into those uncomfortable moments mm -hmm. and not seeing it for what it is right now, but seeing what it could be in the future. So my hope and my encouragement to my uncuffed family is that as leaders, followers, whatever you are, expand your capacity because it's a benefit to others 
yeah. and that's what we can do. Um, we we serve people when we can expand our capacity a lot better. So this was episode seven, and I'm so happy to have had this conversation with Pastor Chris, and I look forward to seeing you guys again. Mm.